without system in which uh, uh, in the bulk they are isolated system, uh, isolated systems, but at the surface they are just uh, conducting systems, something like that. Okay. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you for coming to me here again. Uh, thank you also for the introduction. Uh, so today I will talk about a topic which has become quite fashionable uh, very recently. Uh, so it concerns uh, a new class of materials which has some very uh, unusual properties. So there are these so-called uh, topological insulators uh, which are insulating uh, in the bulk, but typically they have conducting uh, surface states or edge states. Uh, so you know this is a relatively new uh, area of research. So basically, the whole story started roughly in 2006. There were already conferences and workshops organized on the topic, and there were even starting to appear review articles. Uh, and the production in this area is very high, so it's a bit difficult to always follow up with the recent developments. And the reason for all this excitement is probably uh, manifold. So, you know, from one point of view, it was a large surprise that after all this time, uh, sort of that we understand simple band insulator. But then it turned out that there are some details which sort of went unnoticed from early days of quantum mechanics until very recently. Uh, this is one point. The other point is probably that these materials uh, have high potential for applications because. Uh, from one part, they have dissipationless uh, conductance on surfaces, so they might find application in electronics. There are also some uh, unusual magnetic properties on the surface, which again suggest that they might be used in spintronics applications. They also have very unusual excitation properties, uh, but other exotic things which were actually not observed, uh, such as Majorana electrons. And finally, from materials point of view, these materials are relatively simple, so they're easy to produce, and uh, this kind of makes the barrier uh, to enter the field rather low. Uh, personally, for me, uh, what is interesting is that these materials show unusual effects uh, on surfaces. Um, since I have some background as a surface physicist, this sort of attracted my attention. Uh, so, the sort of outline uh, for my talk today. Uh, I, I will start by giving some general ideas, and I, I will try to define this term. So it turns out that this term is not perhaps the most appropriate, but somehow got in common usage, so it needs to be really uh, explained. Um, then I will, uh, the main, main part, I will talk mostly about a particular class of topological insulators, so that sometimes referred to as strong three-dimensional topological insulators. So it's extended bulk materials, and they turn out to have surface states with rather unusual properties. Uh, for one thing, uh, the surface states have relativistic dispersion, so they behave as uh, Dirac particles. There's a single Dirac tone, which makes them quite different from graphene, which has four-fold degeneracy. Um, so as I alluded before, uh, there's it's called spin momentum rocking, which means that the electrons which propagate in a certain direction have a well-defined spin. Uh, and there are some other properties. Um, but then in the final part, I will really switch to what I actually did uh, in this respect. So it has to do with the uh, impurity effects. So for that, I will need to explain a few things about the time reversal symmetry, but then I will come to the uh, main part. Uh, namely, it turns out that these surface states can be perturbed by magnetic impurities. But now, uh, the very term itself, uh, magnetic impurities needs to be used very carefully because impurities which are expected to be magnetic may become effectively non-magnetic due to the screening effect, so the well-known contact effect. So uh, what I suggest is to use, uh, to qualify the word magnetic, and I will use either say nominally magnetic or effectively magnetic. So in, in the first case, one just refers to what is the behavior at some higher temperatures without screening, and these impurities can then, in certain condition, conditions, become non-magnetic. But uh, we, we will come to that. Okay. Um, so the, the, the main sort of this, the main concept in solid state in mathematical physics is that of different states of matter or of different phases. And uh, one of the major interests in uh, solid state physics is to 
character as the different uh, phases and study phase transitions between them. And until somewhere around 1980s, it was thought that uh, you can fully characterize different uh, states of matter by discussing their uh, symmetries. And uh, no symmetry phases or uh, 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 so one would characterize states by describing which of the symmetries have been broken. Uh, in this case, one would expect the long range correlations in the system. This in turn can be quantified by order parameters um, to describe the behavior of the system and the phase transitions one would typically use Landau theory of phase transitions. But roughly in the 1980s, uh, people have noticed that one can have different phases which have exactly the same symmetry properties, but they are still uh, distinguished by something else. And it turned out that this something else has to do with topological properties of materials. Um, so um, then um, this one then talks about topological order, which is characterized by some new topological quantum numbers, and then it has some topological field theories to describe these materials. Um, but let's start with um, what is well known. So as a simple example, one can discuss symmetry breaking solid liquid phase transition. So in this case, um, in the high symmetry, so in the non-ordered high temperature phase, one has a liquid state which is transitional invariant, so irrespective of what point you're considering, when you do a time energy, you will get exactly the same answer. Uh, but when you go to the low temperature ordered phase, now there are special points in the space which have unique properties of the other points where you are uh, nuclei are located, and uh, you can describe your system by a lattice. So this corresponds to an order parameter, which is one of the com Fourier transform components of your, um, this group, if your uh, just tends to should be enough. And experimentally, you observe this transition, uh, for example, using uh, X-ray. Uh, if you would start observing some break reflection peaks in your um, reflection pattern. And this kind of transition can be described by simple and uh, effective uh, free energy. OK, but now let us switch to the insulators. So basically, insulators quite generally are materials which do not conduct electricity. And it turns out that there are several classes of them. So uh, we can have materials which do not conduct uh, simply because of their uh, band properties. So these are the most known insulators. But then again, we also have mod insulators, which are non-conductive because of the electron interactions. And we have Anderson insulators, which are non-conductive because of disorder. But at least for the bent insulators, people somehow consider that uh, everything is quite well known since, let's say, early works of Brodin, that was 1938. Um, OK, so just to give you some examples, um, maybe non typical example, so the vacuum itself is an insulator, of course. So if you want to cut, ex excite, uh, generate excitations in the vacuum, you really need to provide enough energy to generate electron positron pairs. Uh, so in a sense, vacuum is then insulated with a gap of the order of mega electron volts. So more commonly, uh, more common insulators would be uh, the uh, it's like one device one that insulator, so this would be, for example, argon, which is solidified. So this is essentially just an aggregate rate of atoms, uh, which are held together by the van der Waals force. They do not really have any real bands to speak of. So basically, you need enough energy to excite an electron from one of the valence levels to one of the unoccupied levels. And this corresponds to energies of the order of 10 electron volts. And finally, uh, the bent insulators that are most useful, so uh, ordinary uh, oxide insulators or uh, semiconductors. These are uh, materials which are strongly covalent bonded, but it turns out that their uh, bent structure is such that uh, some bands are completely filled, but other bands are completely empty, and there is a forbidden band in between them, the gap. On Fermi level, is somewhere in this gap. So, this is the standard picture of insulators. So the main idea here is that you do not have any low energy excitations in the system. But then in 1980, uh, there was a funny state of matter which was uh, observed. Uh, I mean, the, uh, when you 
put a two-dimensional electron gas in a very strong magnetic field. Uh, basically, your electrons will form uh, lambda levels. Or if you want to have a more semi classical picture, you can imagine that your, ele your electrons are circulating on cyclotron orbits. So they are kind of localized. And it turns out that um, if you, the magnetic field is strong enough, you will have your Fermi level right between uh, to lambda levels, which means that your system is gap, so you will expect it to be an insulator, which is sort of easy to understand from this picture. So electrons are really localized uh, by the action of the magnetic field. Um, but that turned out not to be quite the whole story because this material is actually uh, conducting. So if you apply uh, a transverse electric field, you will serve a, a current. And not only that, this current turned out to be quantized uh, in units of E square over H, uh, which was a rather surprising result at the time. Uh, it turns out that this can be accounted to, again, in a sort of semi-classical pictures uh, by the presence of edge states. So if you want, you can picture that the electron at the edge has to bounce back and it can hop at the edge of your uh, material. Uh, this is maybe not the most accurate picture, but um, you have a better, uh, uh, a more detailed understanding of it later. Uh, but all this story uh, sort of uh, um, brought us to consider uh, a new class of materials uh, which, as I will show, have some unusual properties in the band structure in the reciprocal space. So um, okay, I will turn up explain the origin of this term. So topological uh, does not have anything to do with the shape of your sample. So it has something to do with the topological properties of your uh, of your uh, band structure in the reciprocal space. Uh, I will show you an example just in a few moments. And as for the insulator part, it turns out that this is not quite appropriate because many of these materials are in fact conducting, at least on the surface, and many are even conducting in the bulk because uh, uh, there is a sufficient concentration of impurities. But they still do show unusual properties in spite of the fact that they are not uh, fully kept, not even in the bulk. Uh, so one should. Uh, one should not take this expression too literally. So in some sense, quantum Hall effect uh, materials do belong to this class, but this is really a state which is induced in high magnetic fields and is observed at very low temperatures. Whereas what is really generating the attention in recent years are this new class of materials which uh, have unusual properties, even at room temperature and uh, in the absence of an external magnetic field. And, uh, to emphasize the absence of the field one sometimes characterizes them as time reversal invariant topological insulators. Um, so this is just some of the workers in the field, so there are many more. And clearly this is something which is um, basically a research area which is just starting uh, in recent years. So many of the experimental results have been actually published in 2009 uh, this year. Um, okay, now, so now we sort of came to the important point. So, uh, band structure, in the narrower sense of the term, uh, when one talks about the band structure, one is referring to this kind of plots. So here we are plotting uh, energy levels as a function of a point in the reciprocal space. Typically one just draws lines along some special symmetry lines. Uh, in reality, this case space is of course three-dimensional for uh, real three-dimensional materials. But this plot does not contain all the information. So in reality, if one would really start to, would want to know the properties of the uh, band structure, one should really be interested in also in the wave function itself. So in this more, it's a mathematical sense, a band structure would then be a mapping from your Brillouin zone, so all the, the set of all the non-equivalent uh, momentum points, to the Hilbert space of your wave function. Um, furthermore, uh, it's known that if you have a periodic structure, um, you can always decompose your function, uh, your wave function in the following way. So you have a plane wave component and the part which is uh, uh, periodic in, in real space. So these are really the objects which contain the uh, sort of non-trivial information. And since we're talking about topology, so topology is really the study of different classes of materials which are, can only be distinguished um, by transformations in which you cut them. 
whereas other materials which will be just uh, made identical by smooth, and just by, uh, by, by, by simply deforming them a bit, they are considered to be equivalent. Uh, so in this context, our smooth transformations will be changes of Hamiltonian, but such that the gap is always open. Right? So this is smooth transformation. And just to give you an example from, let's say, so, uh, usual uh, topology of um, geometrical objects. Um, if you take uh, an arbitrary, um, so arbitrary object, in three, so which is embedded in three dimension by some surface, uh, you calculate the Gaussian curvature at each point, okay. then take an integral over the surface of this Gaussian curvature and divide the result by 2 pi, you will get an integer. Yeah. This is a very non trivial result. So if you would deform the sphere in an ellipsoid or to a cube, you would get uh, basically the same result. It's high per 2. And this is topologically different, so you get a zero. And in fact, this number sort of counts the numbers of poles in your object. So for a double pole, so an object with two poles, you will get minus one, etc. Uh, but now, let us consider um, uh, topological properties of our band structure. So what we do here, we take this, uh, these are our periodic parts. Uh, so we have one for each k point, and we do a summation for <coughs> all the occupied uh, states. So this is well-defined because, as I said, um, we always have a gap. So it is well-defined which levels are occupied and which are not. Uh, so this ob object, which is called bearing connection, this is sort of uh, direction in the reciprocal space in which the changes between the neighboring wave functions are the largest. Right? Because if the wave function would not be changing, this derivative would be zero. So so this is sort of the direction of largest uh, uh, changes in the space. And then if you calculate a um, um, vector product of this quantity, you obtain what is called a Berry curvature. And again, if you integrate that over your entire Berryland uh, zone, divided by 2 pi, you get an integer number. Uh, OK, so this is, at this level, this is just a, a mathematical curiosity. But what, is, uh, what was quite unexpected uh, was when Taos and co-worker have calculated the conductance of quantum pole effect system uh, using the Kubo formula. And they were able to show that uh, that parameter n in the expression which I have shown you is precisely the same n given by this expression, which means that the conductance in the quantum pole state is very strongly quantized, and in fact, even experiments can show that this quantization gives an accuracy to nine digits of precision. In fact, this accuracy is so high that this is now used as a new resistance standard. Uh, okay, uh, but now, up to now, I've been talking about these quantum effects of this field state, which occurs for a very strong magnetic field. Uh, but what is funny is that even in the absence of the magnetic field, there is sort of internal magnetic field in your problem, if you look at it in a certain sense. So if you look at the spin orbit coupling, so spin orbit coupling is basically a relativistic effect which arises from the fact that in the rest frame of your electron, uh, the electrons is not only the electric field of the nucleus, but also an induced magnetic field. So its spin uh, will experience sort of effect of zimmel, zimmel splitting. So this is not really the whole picture, so to get the correct result, one really has to start from the direct equation, but nevertheless, one can derive this expression, uh, which sort of shows two important things. <coughs> one of all is that um, if you really evaluate the expectation value of this operator, it would turn out that the splitting scales is the four power of the atomic number divided by uh, this principal quantum number to the power of three. So, even though there's some compensation, still you would expect much larger effects at the bottom of the periodic system. This is one point uh, well known. Uh, but uh, another point which is worth noticing is that if you look uh, how this orbital and spin uh, sectors are coupled together, basically it means that uh, for spin up electrons, for example, they experience a given uh, effective magnetic field and spin down electrons will experience an effective magnetic field which is exactly the opposite. So this is one way of looking at it. And 
Uh, then you can start thinking about what would happen if you just consider separately your spin up electrons and spin down electrons. And it turns out that this is much like having two copies of quantum poly electron, uh, yeah, quantum, quantum poly effect system, but uh, seeing opposite effective magnetic field, which is in this case induced by intrinsic spin of the starting. And it turns out that um, uh, these states have been predicted before, and more recently, also, uh, what people have known before is that you, you have some spin accumulation uh, due to spin orbit happening. What is new is that uh, this effect can be quantized, and this indeed gives the states which are insulating in the bulk and have a helical edge states, which means that along the edge of the material you have spin up electrons which are propagating in one direction, and spin down electrons which are propagating in the counter direction. So this was predicted roughly in 2006, and it was indeed observed in 2007 in some quantum well heterostructures. What is funny here is that um, uh, not only did the theories predict the effect, but they even predicted the precise material where this effect would be uh, exhibited. So they actually gave a very precise information to the experiment, experimentalists uh, about what they should look into. Um, perhaps this has helped to such a rapid progress in this field. Okay, so um, to proceed, uh, maybe we need to uh, get a bit more technical. So one very important aspect is the uh, operation of reversing the direction of time. Uh, so if you do that, all the operators which are associated with some time derivative uh, are reversed. So for example, uh, momentum and angular momentum, they will be reversed. So quantum mechanically, a time reversal can be described as this operator. Uh, so k is the conjugation operator on your orbital wave function, while the second part sort of rotates your spin uh, by pi, uh, thereby inversing the spin. Uh, what, what is funny for half integer spin electrons, if you rotate uh, your spin uh, by full circle, you do not obtain the same thing. You obtain the same function multiplied by minus one. Uh, and what follows from this is that if you do two consecutive time reversal operations, you do not obtain identity but minus one, but minus identity. And this leads to the well-known degeneracy, Kramer degeneracy, which tells you that in the absence of, in the presence of time reversal symmetry, all states in your systems are twice degenerate, or at least twice degenerate. Uh, okay, just two comments. So, uh, spin orbit coupling does not break time reversal symmetry, but of course, magnetic field does. So this will be important in the following. Um, now why, why this is important? Uh, so if you do have time reversal uh, invariant system, it means that you have rather strong constraints uh, about the states in your recipro reciprocal space. Uh, so taking a given k and minus k states, they should have the same energy because they're uh, they form a Kramer's duplet, so two degenerate states. But there are special points in your reciprocal space where uh, if you do time, time, reversal, time uh, inversion operation, you end up at the same point. So at these particular points, uh, one of them is, of course, the center of the Brillouin zone or it could be the edges of the Brillouin zone. So at these points, st your states need to be twice degenerate. Uh, what happens in between is not really restrained. But now you have various different ways of uh, how this connect, uh, these states at the edges are connected. So one obvious thing would be that you, you would expect some splitting for uh, uh, due to the spin orbit coupling uh, for your momenta between the two points. But what can also happen uh, in principle is that uh, you have this kind of connectivity, right? And there's a big difference between the two in that if you now imagine that you have a family level right here, uh, this state can, uh, these states can intersect the family level or not. So and if you do uh, deformations, uh, you could get either zero or two intersections or, or any given number. Whereas in this case, you have at least one intersection or in general an odd number of intersections. So uh, with this kind of connectivity, you expect uh, to have a state of the family level. And 
So I will not get to the mathematics, but uh, you can abstract this information to some new topological uh, quantum numbers which can take values of plus and minus one. And <coughs> those materials which have uh, non-trivial uh, values are precisely those which show the quantum spin for effect. But I will not really talk about this particular cast of materials because I would like to focus to, on the three-dimensional topological insulators. So now these are three-dimensional materials which are sort of generalization of the quantum spin hole effect. But they have different properties. So instead of having an head state, um, which was expected for two-dimensional problem, you now have surface states, which are again helical. So you have a coupling between the direction of motion and the spin. And uh, yeah, maybe it's worth mentioning that also these classes of materials were predicted in roughly 2006. And again, in this case, they roughly knew in which materials one should look for these effects. And in fact, in a uh, recent couple of years, uh, there are very strong evidence that these states do indeed exist. And I will, in fact, show a few plots. But uh, just before I start, uh, I'm just short internet. So, so surface states. So these are the states which can arise on surfaces of materials for energies uh, which fall in the gap of your bulk material. So for your bulk states, when you get to the edge of the state, you just have sort of exponential decay in the vacuum. Whereas uh, in bulk region, uh, in the gap energy regions, you do not have propagating electrons on the bulk, uh, in the bulk, but you can still have some exponential decay. So you can have states which are localized at the surface and they can, in fact, propagate on the surface. It forms some kind of two-dimensional electron gas. And importantly, these states can be measured with the angle, angular result of photon emissions of So basically, you're shooting in photons and then measure the energies of outgoing electrons. And you can do that with resolution in the momentum space, which basically allows you to measure the band structure of the material. Okay, uh, now comes the important part. But before I was explaining that uh, by making smooth transformation such that the gap uh, was always open, uh, we were able to move between various members in the same topology class. Uh, but this means the following. So we have uh, a boundary between a, uh, an insulating material with some topological quantum number and a material with a different topological quantum number, you cannot go from one to the other one without uh, closing the gap. Right? And closing the gap basically tells you that you have a conducting state somewhere on the interface between the two materials. And uh, so this is just a simple topological fact and it's sort of unavoidable. So uh, you sort of have a topological guarantee that such a surface state will exist in our material. Uh, what is less clear that was shown in theoretical metaphor measurement that uh, in some of these materials your surface state can be the simplest possible surface states which are uh, uh, Dirac states. Uh, okay, I will not enter into this also. For those people who are interested in graphene, I will just mention that this is sort of one quarter of graphene because you do not have any speed degeneracy, you don't have any value degeneracy. So this is really the simplest case when you have uh, single Dirac fermions propagating uh, into dimensions. Okay, so um, I'll show some experimental results. Um, so these are now Arpa's uh, results for the states on the surface of this bismuth. Uh, to the lurium free materials, so these are sort of layered materials uh, which are held together by Van der Waals forces, a bit like graphite, for example. And what you can see here, these are the bulk valence states, these are the bulk uh, conductance states, and indeed in between you see uh, a very well defined uh, surface, a band of surface states which somehow does seem to have a Dirac dispersion. Of course, this material turned out not to be perfect. For one thing, you see that you, you in fact have some conducting bulk states uh, at the Fermi level, so it's not really a bulk, bulk insulator. And also, your direct point is sort of overlapping with uh, your bulk valence band. Nevertheless, uh, later developments have shown that you can controllably dope uh, your material or the surface, uh, thereby shifting the Fermi level. Uh, 
to the true value gap, and at the same time, you can also shift the direct point anywhere, basically, in the gap region. Okay, so this was one of the early results. The, another important point was to actually show that you do indeed have uh, this spin momentum working. Right? Because of the time reversal symmetry, you, you expect this kind of relation. So if you go from one point to the other across your uh, sort of two-dimensional Brillouin zone, you would expect the opposite spin. And uh, the way to measure it is by using spin result arpas, where you're basically accelerating electrons which are coming from your hemispherical detector to an aluminum uh, gold foil, which itself has very strong spin volt coupling, uh, which leads to the fact that you can uh, resolve the spin of your um, electrons on the surface. Um, but, uh, I just copied a little plot from one of these experimental papers. So, this, so if you believe this is also error bars are large, but nevertheless, you do see that it has a certain well defined angular dependence, which sort of, sort of proves that um, this picture is better. So, at this point, the spin is always oriented perpendicular to the direction of your electron motion. Um, okay. Now another important thing is that uh, in presence of uh, time reversal symmetry, uh, any kind of time reversal invariant operator will, you, uh, will not have any matrix elements between two time reversal, uh, so between the Kramer's duplex states. In other words, this means that uh, you will not have any backscattering. In quantum picture, the reason is that uh, the backscattering you would also need to flip your spin, but this would break your time reversal invariance, so this is forbidden. Or if you prefer more semi-classical picture, uh, you always have two backscattering paths, either like this or in the opposite direction. And the difference between the two is that in all cases you need to rotate the spin, and the total spin rotation is 2 pi, but as I told you before, this corresponds to the change of phase of minus 1. So this leads again to the total destructive interference. And this is sort of experimental proof that this indeed uh, happens. So what they did was to measure the density of states at an edge on a surface using the tip of the STM. And uh, this is what you typically expect. So we have some oscillations which arise from standing the pattern to even find a nice fit to the uh, basic function. But when you get to the energy range where you expect the surface surface state, then it turns out that uh, uh, here the, this oscillation is not so pronounced, but here you don't really even see it at all. Uh, so this is one of the earlier, earliest examples, but now people are also starting what happens when you have a single impurity, and again, from the pattern of the standing waves, they can conclude that you do not have any scattering uh, directly in the, in the opposite direction. Uh, they also performed lambda quantization experiments now with a magnetic field. So this experiment sort of shows that your surface electrons really are direct particles. Uh, there are two sort of smoking gun uh, uh, effects can clearly observe here. One is that you have always a lambda level directly at the Fermi level. And the other thing is that these uh, higher uh, lambda levels uh, scale as the square root of uh, your magnetic field. So this is sort of conclusive proof that you indeed have a single uh, Dirac chrome surface. Now we're coming to the uh, impurity effect. So as I told you before, if you have non-magnetic impurities, uh, you do not really perturb your material. But you can only, uh, so this surface state is topologically protected. So you can shift your direct point up and down and so on, but uh, you will still have conducting states on your surface. Uh, however, when you do have magnetic impurities, the time reversal symmetry is broken, and now you have no topological guarantee uh, for the gap to be closed. And indeed, uh, by doping the surface, of fact, even the bulk, I believe, uh, they were able to show that um, a gap does indeed open. So at this point, I got interested in this uh, story. Uh, and in Rubin, we're doing some STM experiments with magnetic impurities on normal metals. And it turns out that um, the question of what constitutes um, magnetic impurity is not so trivial. So the main question would be what really are, so which elements are those that can provide magnetic impurities? 
So one could uh, first guess would be that one could look into elemental paramagnets. So there's not many, that many of them. So iron, cobalt, nickel, gadolinium, and sprosium. Uh, but more generally, one could perhaps also even expect that most of the transition elements would give you uh, some uh, local moment. Or in fact, if you look at a single atom in the middle of the universe, which does not uh, form any bonds or anything in its vicinity, basically almost the entire periodic system has some moment, except for the gases and elements that uh, have uh, sort of filled shells. So this question is not so easy to answer because when an impurity, an impurity absorbs on the surface, there is some donation of electrons from your impurity to the surface and back again. Uh, this depends on individual surface, on the local geometry, on also on the possible presence of uh, other impurities and so on. So all these little chemical details are important here. Uh, so what one can do at the end is just perform calculations using some what people could consider as to be state of the art of the presence of this density functional theory calculations. And one could guess that those impurities which show some momentum in DFT are potential magnetic impurities. Uh, but I would really call those nominally magnetic impurities because DFT does not really take into account many particle effects. So one could then ask what really happens when you uh, consider the full many particle problem. Is your impurity still magnetic or not? And does this open a gap uh, or do we still have uh, this topological protection? Uh, so just so I guess many of you have heard about the contact vector. So I will just explain it in sort of a schematic way. So at high temperature, basically, when you have a, an impurity moment, it behaves as a, as a magnet, so it's a small spin somewhere in your system. But then, uh, due to exchange coupling with your uh, conductance, then it turns out that at low temperature, this spin will form a sort of cloud, which as a totality has spin zero. So it's magnetically non-active, and for all practical purposes, your impurity will not uh, break time reversal symmetry. Right? So now the question is uh, what happens with impurities on topological insulators? So, uh, okay, I'm just going to introduce the models first. Okay. So uh, the simple description just takes a single spin uh, that is coupled to your uh, uh, electron cloud by local exchange interaction. If you want to have a more sophisticated model, it turns out to be necessary. You can consider the Anderson model, which is basically just a single level uh, below the Fermi level, which also has some on-site repulsion. So at low enough temperature, you will have a single spin on the level. And this gives you another realization of an impurity. And OK, this is a calculation. So this sort of is more accurate expression of what really happens as a function of the temperature. So um, the bottom line is that at very so this is logarithmic plot of uh, spin susceptibility, which measures your uh, magnetic response to the system. So at very high temperatures, where all, these op or all these possibilities are possible for your impurity, you will have some magnetic effect related to the presence of these two uh, states. Then in this central region, uh, at intermediate temperature, only these two states are relevant and you will have a strong magnetic response. So in this case, you can really say that your magnetic impurity is indeed magnetic. And then at low temperature, when you have a screening of your spin, your impurity is, for all practical purposes, uh, purposes effectively uh, non-magnetic. OK, but now, now we have a very different situation. So on a helical electron liquid on a surface, the spin symmetry is broken. Uh, there is still total angular momentum, which is conserved. Uh, nevertheless, some people have um, suggested that one might have incomplete quantum screen, saying that only two thirds of the impurity the previous freedom are screened, whatever that is supposed to mean. And they predicted that you would have residual degrees of freedom and some anomalies in the low temperature behavior of the system. And uh, so what I will explain in the following five minutes, uh, rushing through some equations, is that actually uh, this problem can be met to the standard Anderson impurity model for which we know that there is a complete screening and that there are no anomalous features. Uh, so actually, 
Yeah, the, the work initially got published, but they corrected the mistake, so they, they no longer claim that there are anonymous. The published was version of the book. But anyway, so the idea here is that this problem still has some reversal symmetry, so there seems to be it's really likely that you can indeed uh, have complete compensation for spin. And the approach which I have followed is to reduce the problem to uh, an effective one dimensional Wilson chain problem for which uh, the solution is known for quite some time that it is not completely scanned. Uh, so, this is the starting point uh, our helical electron band. So it takes a very similar form to spin orbit. Uh, in terms like Rush or Dreser House, but now the point is that this is not a perturbation, but is the only part of the Hamiltonian. Uh, so basically, we have, uh, yeah, this just describes a single Dirac column of electrons. We uh, have a picture which I will show later. So as for the impurity part, it is just a standard Anderson impurity model, and assuming that we have some isotropic hybridization. So this is important, but I will not, would not like to get into these technicalities. Uh, so I will just go quick. So first step is just to go to do the standard step by going from discrete to the continuous notation. The reason to do that is that we want to do a decomposition into various angular modes. So this is fairly standard, but we now also include a, a spin matrix factor which depends itself on the angle, right? And uh, the only Thing one has to be care has to really to be careful about in this kind of transformation is that all the transformations need to be unitary and that when you go from one set of harmonic operators you need to take care that the canonical and implementation relations are always satisfied. This is the only uh, technical point. Um, so then uh, this is to show that uh, using this um, spin rotation you can find you can obtain a diagonal form for your uh, for your band Hamiltonian. And now the spin index here basically will just correspond either to upper or to the lower Dirac cone. So that's a new interpretation. But since we have a coupling between momentum and direction, uh, this index also in some fact contains information about the spin itself. Okay, then we also need to transform the hybridization term, which gets this complicated form. You then switch to energy representation. And uh, then here comes the important point. So at this point, you have coupling between all the different angular uh, uh, channels. But then if you look carefully, uh, your impurity only covers the given uh, combination of these states. So if you take just the sum over m, you can have either p factors gamma and minus or gamma and plus. These are just, these are just some numbers. And if you take this particular combination, it is easy to show that they are, in fact, uh, orthogonal. Uh, so if you take this combination of states, you still have canonical and anti commutation relations, so these are very defined operators. Uh, this simplifies your Hamiltonian. Then you take into account that some of the operators are only defined for positive energies so on the upper Dirac cone and some for the lower, so you can recombine them. Uh, so the two 10 operators which are defined for all energies. Uh, so we get further simplification. And now since uh, your, your uh, G and H operators, so these are just some labels, you might as well replace those labels with a total pseudo spin degree of freedom. So this is just remaining. And what you obtain at the end is just a conventional Anderson impurity model which has been studied for many decades, and for this model it is known that you can affect full screen. Uh, so basically that's it. So this is a quick summary. Uh, I would just like to, for uh, people who are interested more in this kind of things, that um, this can be actually generalized. And, um, as far as I can tell, for any Anderson-like model, whatever the band, uh, how, how complicated this is, you can always map the problem to a single, single, uh, to standard single channel impurity model. So maybe this is an important message which is not so obvious. Uh, the other message perhaps is that if you try to do the same derivation with a condo impurity, uh, you will not be able to disentangle these uh, different angular channels. Uh, this could seem a bit of a contradiction the, because the two models are supposed to be uh, related by the shifter wall transformation, but it turns out that it's, only, it's important to do the transformations in the correct order. 
the final simple final Hamiltonian. Uh, okay, so uh, this I will conclude. So the main point here is that uh, spin orbit coupling really leads, leads to uh, unexpected and non trivial properties in materials. Uh, so this was perhaps the biggest surprise uh, in this field. Uh, but what might be important to emphasize is that the bottom part of the periodic system is not very well explored. So we really know very little about some classes of materials. We know a lot about uh, transition metals and their oxides. We know a lot about, about certain ternary compounds. But we know relatively little about uh, elements at the bottom of the periodic system. So there might be different unexpected phases that still to be discovered here. And also this area is probably great news for surface physicists because one of the interesting things are happening on the surface. So a few years ago where people were studying things like IPC superconductors, they were always complaining that they cannot really see what's happening in the bulk because they have problems with the presence of surface states. But now, uh, so called the opposite. Now people are complaining that they have problems doing certain experiments, experiments because it's the bulk states which are sort of uh, making things a bit more difficult for them. Uh, but in any case, these systems are easy to probe, probe by STM and by uh, ARPA's kind of experiments. And these are very controlled experiments and there are many opportunities for doing very nice physics. But very fundamental physics here on these classes uh, of systems. Okay, thank you for your attention. Because you have 
by, by, by changing the temperature, because at high temperature you have local moment and it's not a screen. So this then this can affect the time reversal symmetry of the system. Now the difficulty here is perhaps that if you're at finite temperatures, so you're, you will not really be able to see your Dirac point with high accuracy to really okay. see so if there is a vapor mass. And you are it's always close to decay in the experiment or around that. In which yeah, they might be completely. I mean, what in reality happens is that you will also have magnetic anisotropy of the effects on the surface. And this can stabilize your momentum irrespective of the presence of the work on the effect. This is one point. The other point is that uh, you will have uh, FKKY coming. Yeah. Uh, and in this case, your momentum will order, which will really be at least for a uh, time reversal symmetry break because it's a magnetically ordered state. And then you will expect to see the opening. So this is really uh, a question of what happens at the single impurity level. Yes, so, but, uh, so the, the, the I don't think this could be directly measured. Yeah. So it was mostly a question whether there are residual degrees of freedom or not. And if you have a system of several impurities that, that they don't uh, talk each other by a kind of Y, then for instance by super chain maybe two impurities, yeah. then you will obtain something similar with the contacts that are these, these uh, chemical systems. Yeah, I'm not sure how one would actually, I mean, what one could do is probe this kind of impurities with less than to the spectroscopy as a function of temperature, and maybe one would see something. Uh, I mean, I mean this is a very simplified model, right? Yes. So to, to really describe what will happen, and one would need more sophisticated, probably. I mean, at the very least, one would probably take, you need to take into account many of the kinds of people, which are known to be present. Yes, I see. And, and the existence of this cone, this data point, yeah. is because the topological number just changed in the surface. Yes. So this is the uh, kind of a yeah, it's method to... It's not only produce that you have... Uh, predict this. ...that you have conducting sets, but they, they need to be in the app like... Uh, so because... Uh, because it's just one point. Yeah, and which it has to touch, right? Yes. So yeah. the only at some way point it has to intersect and yes. you have at least at some energy range it will have the right line distortion. Uh, I mean this, this was this is sort of clear from that connectivity plot which I yes. shown. So if you make an intersection so right and, and then, then you need to consider that this has to be rotated. This needs to be a to take a shape of uh, the arc. Backscattering, 
But there are particular directions where you can have uh, very strong discussion.